You're listening to Beyond Wellness Radio, bringing you the cutting edge in health, biohacking, and sports performance. Stay up to date and listen anywhere and anytime on your computer, tablet, or smartphone by subscribing on iTunes. Catch your host, Dr. Justin Marcajani, as he answers your burning health questions as well as interviews from world-renowned guest experts. For more Beyond Wellness Radio, go to beyondwellnessradio.com. Hey there, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani. Welcome to Beyond Wellness Radio. Feel free and head over to beyondwellnessradio.com where you can access our full podcast transcriptions. While you're there, you can also sign up for our thyroid and female hormone video series. This series goes into the root cause of why your hormones are out of balance. While you're there, you can also schedule a functional medicine consult with Dr. Justin, myself, where we'll dig deeper into the root cause of your health challenges. Feel free and think of sharing this podcast with at least one person. This podcast grows by people sharing it. Sharing is caring. If you can think of one person that can benefit from this information, please feel free and share it. If you're enjoying the podcast, make sure you subscribe on iTunes. You can also click below the video or podcast where you'll see the iTunes review button and leave us a review. You can also sign up for the newsletter at beyondwellnessradio.com where you'll get updates before anyone else. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. Hey there, it's Dr. Justin. We got a great show in store for everyone today. We have Kevin Geary from rebootedbody.com back on the podcast. Really excited. Kevin, how are you doing today, man? Doing great. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here. So what's new with you? I know you got a couple of things going on in, in your sphere on the web. I know you're still running a lot of different online programs, seeing clients. I know you got a, a new program on how to kick cravings coming out real soon. I wanted to see if you can give a little bit of info to the audience on that one. Yeah, definitely. So been been very busy, like you said. Plus, I have a five-month-old, and oh, wow. so we've been dealing with teething issues and all sorts of stuff. So sleep hasn't been great. And, Isn't that uh, number two for you? It is number two. Yeah. So we're, we're going through it all again. Thank you. Um, and I, I think this is going to be the last one. So my sleep will be restored and, and we'll be all back to normal shortly here. Uh, but yeah, on top of that, it's been, been working, developing this new program that we're really excited about. You know, we have, it's called Decoder Cravings. And what I did is um, for a long time, I've been focused on the psychology and mindset side of what it takes to get a body and life you love because I feel like so many people are uh, on a high fact diet, but they're on a low execution diet. Mm. Like they, they collect all these facts and all this research and they're listening to podcasts and reading articles and watching videos. And then they'll implement a little here and there, or they'll implement it all at once, but then it all comes crashing down. They're just, they're, they're struggling with consistency. They're struggling with motivation. They're struggling with overload. It's just, it's a mess, right? And so we see in the health and fitness industry that the success rate is still, regardless of all this new information that's coming out and the access that people have to it, the success rate is still very low. So I wanted to design a program that is dedicated to showing people why they struggle with consistency. Uh, And by the way, I think this would be a good time to tell everybody you know, you have these great intentions of getting a body and life you love. The reason why your behavior doesn't align with those intentions is because it is manipulated. And Mm -hmm. we talk about many, many, many ways that behavior becomes manipulated and is no longer authentic. And that's what the program is designed to show people so that they can finally take everything that they already know to be the case and implement it and make it successful and do that for the rest of their life so that they can quit with the yo-yo dieting and the falling off the wagon and all of this other stuff you hear about. I love it. I was watching a movie, I think it was back in the, the late 90s, and they were in this big laboratory and they were mixing all these different you know, test tubes and solutions together and they, they put the little sample on, on a little um, piece of paper and they smell it and the guy turns to the other and goes, barbecue. <laughs> I just like, oh my gosh. So we're in labs creating these flavors and, and textures and, and things we're adding to food that really aren't even real food. And so much of the issues here that come from people engineering foods that, that kind of give you that addictive, you know, dopamine hit that feels good, like you get from sugar, but it's not even real food. And, and I think a lot of stuff that you talk about is just really eating real food. And a lot of people aren't even doing that. So it's amazing that such low-hanging fruit, like real food, we even have to talk about that today. Can you go into that aspect a little bit? 
Yeah. So one of the biggest manipulators, and of course, you know, somebody that listens to your podcast, they've probably already solved this particular issue. But one of the biggest manipulators people face is following in advice that is antagonistic. That's advice that works against your biological and psychological programming. This is what the health and fitness industry is notorious for, right? They put yes. you on restrictive calorie reduction based diets that don't really focus on food quality. You don't enjoy what you're eating. You're hungry all the time. You are not getting nourished. And therefore your body is like inside, you know, this it's rejecting the, the program that you're following and you can't sustain that. You cannot maintain that long term. People lose weight weight, right? They find success for two or three months, but then it all comes crashing down. And generally they gain back more weight than they started with. So it's a complete disaster. Uh, unfortunately they do this with fitness as well. They follow fitness protocols that they can't possibly sustain. They do CrossFit five days a week at 5 AM on very low sleep. And then they wonder why they get injured. Um, they do P 90 X, but they don't really enjoy it. They just force themselves to do it with willpower and discipline. And then they wonder why they fall off the wagon with that regard. So it's just a repeating pattern of people doing things that they don't really want to do and that their body doesn't want them to do and that their mind doesn't want them to do. And then they wonder why they fail. Um, so like you said, transition Transitioning to real food, suddenly we're giving our body what it actually needs. We're nourishing the body. We're giving it plenty of calories. Everything is great. You can sustain that forever. There's, there's no issues there. So that's always the first step, right? And I think people listening to your podcast have already hopefully oh, yeah. taken that step. Absolutely. I think the next step comes into like kind of dialing in your macros because, you know, we have things like, is it, should you be high carb? Should you be low carb? And my opinion on that is most people that have metabolic damage, they're insulin resistant, they have thyroid issues, they're probably going to do better shifting to a lower carb, higher fat, moderate protein diet, getting dialed in, getting your, your blood sugar and your insulin more sensitive, and then working your way up. How do you kind of dial in your macronutrients, macros being protein, fats, and carbs with your clients and patients? So the, the first thing I would say is when somebody switches off of a standard American diet to a real food based diet, mm -hmm. automatically that's going to have a reduction in carbohydrates, Definitely. typically, mm -hmm. usually a severe reduction in carbohydrates, right? Yes. Then the question becomes like, all right, where are we going to get the majority, the bulk of our carbohydrates from? And the answer to that typically is vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tend to tell people to prioritize vegetables and then berries and then fruits and just to go in that order, right? So when they're gonna eat a plant, because, you know, so the typical advice is eat fruits and vegetables to be healthy, right? Yeah. If I tell 10 people to eat more fruits and vegetables, eight of those 10 people are gonna go eat all fruits and zero vegetables, yes, right? Yes, 100%. So I, I show them, I'm like, all right, let's prioritize. Let's go, when we're gonna eat plants, let's go veggies first, then you would move to the berries, then you would move to the fruits. And then we have to talk about, all right, what role do, if any, do starches play? Well, if you're sitting at a desk all day, and you, all you're really doing is, is walking for exercise. You're not doing anything really high intensity. The question is, do you, do you really need starches? You know, right. uh, if you, so to that person, probably the answer is no. Right. But then you get this other person who is doing some high intensity work, right? Perhaps they need some starches in there, but that's not starches from fake foods, right? right? We're talking sweet potatoes, maybe a little rice here and there. So, uh, kind of, I, I tell people too, that we work on dialing in their carbohydrate intake based on their activity levels. So if you have low activity levels, dial your carbs down lower. If you have higher activity levels, especially if they're higher intensity activities, then dial them up higher. But the, the main principle never changes that it always comes from real food. Yeah. And you talked about real food providing nutrition to your body. And that's important because your brain, as much as it senses calories, calories in nature typically always come with nutrition. Really, we've messed it up today so you can get a whole bunch of calories and not much nutrition. Yeah. So we're getting a whole bunch of carbohydrates, refined sugar, and then we're driving insulin resistance. And as a kind of collateral damage with insulin resistance, we have leptin resistance. And we know leptin is super important to help kind of suppress that appetite and keep us full. Can you talk about how you're trying to address leptin resistance with a lot of the, the clients you're seeing? 
I think switching to real food, like you said, is, yeah. is the main thing we got to do, right? Mm. Uh, the other thing I'm not a big fan of, which going back to the health and fit fitness industries, traditional advice, they're like, eat six times a day, eat yeah. really small meals and all of this. And for the people that I work with, for a couple of reasons, leptin is one of them, but just being like non-obsessive is another big reason. Uh, but I try to get them to just do three meals per day. And the goal is to make it from meal one to meal two rather comfortably. I'm not saying you're not going to get hungry at all ever. I think hunger hunger is a very healthy thing to feel. And in our modern society, we're always trying to like preemptively strike hunger. And we're doing that through snacking. Um, so I want people to go from meal one to meal two pretty comfortably, and then meal two to meal three pretty comfortably, and then to bed. And that's it. Right. So not snacking in between, not grazing constantly throughout the day, just three solid meals. And this also helps people listen to their body and dial in the calories because people get very scared when they're not counting yes. calories and tracking calories. They're like, how do I know I'm not going to overeat? Well, if you're grazing throughout the day, you're eating six times a day, there's a good chance you'll probably overeat in there somewhere because you're not allowing the hunger signals and the satiety signals to really even themselves out. So by doing three meals a day, let's say you eat breakfast and then you get ravishingly hungry two hours before lunch. All right, that's great information. That says you didn't eat enough at breakfast. Or perhaps you need to add, like you were talking about with macros, maybe there wasn't enough protein or there wasn't enough fat. So we need to go back and make some adjustments to breakfast because again, the goal is to get to lunch rather comfortably. So if you do that, if you can eat breakfast and then lunch comes around and you're, yeah. you're normally hungry, right? But you're not like, hangry, right? yeah. you know, your blood yes. sugar is normal. You're not going crazy. That's a good sign that your breakfast was dialed in very well. Then you eat lunch and the same process occurs two hours after lunch. If you're ravishingly hungry, something went wrong at lunch, right? We need to make some adjustments to, to lunch in order to get you to dinner. And we repeat the process until people are very comfortable realizing, all right, this is pretty much how much food I need to eat at every meal. I've got it pretty well dialed in. And then you know, it's freeing. It's freeing because if you have to eat six times a day or you have to always constantly have a snack on hand, that means all you're thinking about all through the day is food, right? Constantly, yeah. constantly. Con and that's what I want to get people to avoid doing. I love that. I love the the hungry versus hangry. I'm going to have to take that one from you. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing that I deal with my patients so much because so much of like the things that I'm dealing with with thyroid and adrenals and autoimmune stuff is blood sugar. Blood sugar fluctuations are a big stress on the immune system. And like you said, I'm a huge fan of not snacking. I call it if you're going to need something in between a meal, it's, it's a mini meal. Mm -hmm. And the only – typically where patients get derailed is from lunchtime to dinner. So they'll have like lunch around like 11.30 or 12, but then they're having dinner around 7 or 8. And they need maybe a little mini meal in between that time frame. So maybe they have like a little shake with uh, maybe some coconut oil and maybe a handful of berries, maybe some pea protein or grass-fed whey or something. So something to kind of get them in between. You know, maybe they do that at 4 o'clock to get them to that dinner at 7 or 8. So I love the idea of not snacking because you want to not be spitting out insulin all the time because if you're constantly spitting out insulin, you're not burning fat. So – I appreciate that perspective. Do you have any other strategies that you do with your patients to help get them to that next meal? I mean, are you just making sure their fat's up and their calories are up? Is there anything else? Yeah, uh, fat and calories and then giving them the information that, look, if you're doing higher intensity exercise, your body is going to demand more calories. If yes. you if you do this higher intensity exercise or even it really if you're like walking a lot, you know, so I recommend people walk. 30 to 60 minutes daily. Uh, and if somebody comes from doing none of that, well, walking 30 to 60 minutes daily is going to increase your, your need for calories. Uh, so you're, if you think that, oh, I'm just going to keep eating the meals I was eating, well, you probably were already under eating. Now yeah. you're adding activity. You're definitely under eating if you don't increase your, your caloric intake. But what I find is that when people are able to hone in on what their body is telling them, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years that humans have pretty much looked very similar to, to what we're doing today, okay? Th this is plenty of time for the body to perfect this system of, oh, here's a hunger signal. Oh, here's a satiety signal. Now, that's complicated, of course, by the fact that if we eat hyper palatable processed foods, it totally screws up the signaling, okay? Yeah. But when somebody's on real food, 
like real food solves many of these issues, right. right? You put somebody on real food, they can go back to trusting their body, what it's telling them. If your body tells you you're hungry, then eat something, yeah. right? Let's stop listening to what my trainer has yes. to say. Let's stop listening to what a calorie spreadsheet has to say and, and my fitness pal and all of this stuff and go back to listening. Our body is so well programmed to, to handle this very, very basic functionality. I think people just need permission to listen because for so yeah. long we've been told, no, you need to listen to the trainer. You need to eat 1200 calories a day. You need to eat 1400 calories a day, especially women. This is like, you know, one of their, their biggest challenges because they've gotten that 1200 calorie, 1400 calorie messaging for probably their entire life. That's very hard to break right? If yeah. you're eating 1200, 1400 calories, you're, you're way under eating. So, um, we need to go back to just listening to our body, giving ourselves permission to eat when my hung, when my body says it's hungry and then yes. stop when my body says it's full. I love that. And the only one caveat I give, cause I see this clinically, the only two major reasons why someone would have to eat a little bit sooner in between meals typically is there's a massive gut issue where they're not breaking down and absorbing their nutrients. So yeah, they're yeah. eating a lot of calories, but the calories aren't getting into their bloodstream. That's number one. And number two, people that just have massive screwed up adrenals and they just can't regulate their blood sugar hormonally. Right. Uh, those are the only two that I see clinically. But again, it still means something. Like you should be able to eat enough food and be able to go five hours in between meals. So if you up the calories and it's still not enough, then and it's a big sign that something deeper is happening. Any yeah, so that, that? no, that's exactly that's exactly what I wanted to get to is that when you start from a, a solid foundation of strategy and principle, right? And you apply it and there's still problems. That's great because that is symptomatic now that there's yes. an underlying issue that needs to be resolved and you can go resolve that actual issue versus if you're playing all of these silly personal trainer games and diet games, you yes. never find this information out. You just think that you're broken. There's something wrong with you. Nothing can help you. Nothing can fix you. You apply the, the real principles and then there's still problems. Then you know, I've got to go deeper into investigation here. I love it. The big thing is I always tell my patients, if something happens, it means something. It doesn't mean yes. we failed. It means right, something right. is going on with the physiology. Write it down because we can we can kind of um, you know walk it backwards to say, all right, where in the physiology did that break down? And then that, that means something and we can kind of like figure out what the next steps are to help fix it. Yeah. Unfortunately, everybody is in a uh, give up very quickly yes. mode, you know, because they're in a race to lose weight. They're in a race to to get to a certain pant size or whatever. And they see these stumbling blocks as a sign that the entire path that they were on needs to be scrapped and they need to go do something new. Uh, and of course, they're always succumbing to shiny object syndrome, yeah. which the health and fitness industry is great at with the latest and greatest equipment. And CrossFit's a big thing now. And oh, this new gym opened up and yeah. they have a lunk alarm or all this nonsense <laughs> that they keep hearing about. And it, it's like ADD and it, it distracts them. And they're like, oh, I got to I got to go do that thing. Sorry, Dr. Justin. I just I got to go do this thing right now. And then they don't ever get help, of course. Um, so, yeah, that's that's important to say. That makes sense. Now, a couple other things I wanted to touch upon here. Um, one thing I see with my patients a lot is they come over, they, let's say they have a standard American diet. Most patients I see that are already are on a really good diet, but the ones that aren't, let's say 50 to 60% of their diet's crap. We get them switched over. We sub the grains for greens. We move them into a healthy anti-inflammatory, nutrient-dense, low-toxin diet. Do you ever see your patients eating just lower calorie by accident because so much of their diet was crap and they haven't subbed it with enough good stuff? And a lot of the good stuff, if it's like vegetable base, it's pretty low in calories compared to like, let's say, starch and, and grains and a whole bunch of junk food. Any feedback on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's especially, and I noticed this, the lower carb they go, yes. they tend to under eat even more, right? So there is, uh, um, in that regard, like there's evidence for asking them to make sure they're eating some fruit, um, some berries, yeah. things like that, that can help. Uh, alleviate that. But yeah, when the food is so satiating, you know, the amount of protein and fat that they're now eating versus what they were eating in terms of just junk food that of course it's got bad fats in it, but it's like mostly carbohydrate sugar driven foods. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, they, they do tend to under eat. So it's just something that we have to pay attention to and also helping them again. I think 
even though they may be full in the moment and they've eaten less, they're still going to realize that they still can't make it to lunch or they still can't make it to dinner. And that's letting them know, Hey, you're under eating here or energy levels too. You know, they're like, my energy is still down. Uh, I'm, are you sleeping well? Yeah, I'm, I'm sleeping well, but my energy is still low. All right, well, let's look at calorie intake there. Right. So that's a symptom that you're not getting enough. And then of course, if they're moving a lot on top of that, it's just kind of retraining them to know what their body actually needs based on what they're doing now. Yeah, I love that because I see a lot of patients that have thyroid issues because I specialize in thyroid and adrenal and hormone dysfunction. We we fix, we put them on some programs. They're still complaining about fatigue and being tired. And then we look at their food diary and I tell them, I go, hey, you know, you're having 1,100 calories a day. I go, how's the Auschwitz diet doing? And they go, what? <laughs> right. They go, they go, what do you mean? I go, well, you know, the people in the Auschwitz concentration camp over in Austria, I think, they had only 1,100 calories a day. I mean, I don't understand why you're in, why you're on the concentration camp diet. <laughs> Yeah, so that's I've asked a, a handful of people to count their calories based on what they were were eating, and I've never done it to show them they were eating too much. Right. I've always done it to show them, hey, you're not eating enough here, right? Yeah. So, and I only have them do it a couple times. It's just as a learning experiment because, again, I'm I'm very anti. Like, I, I don't think that a human being, which of course we're an animal, if you look at another animal like a, a lion, right? A lion doesn't wake up in the morning and like strap on a Fitbit and go, <laughs> yeah, I really need to get like 10,000 steps in today. Uh, let me check my fitness pal to see how many calories I ate yesterday, you know, determine what I need to do today. All they do is wake up and live their life and because they're eating real food and because they're moving naturally and because they're getting plenty of sunlight and sleep, guess what? Lions are freaking healthy and you don't see obese lions. So I think human Human beings have to learn to do the same thing. Like we don't need spreadsheets. We don't need calculators. We don't need all of this crazy nonsense. We just need to commit to real food and functional movement and good healthy lifestyle habits yeah. and fix whatever underlying disorders are affecting us at the current time. And when that happens, it's, it's look, it's not a, it's not a yeah. miracle. It's not a secret. All right. It's just, it's just persistence. Yeah, that makes sense. Now I see a lot of patients in my clinic that Essentially, they have starving brains. I mean, we see it today with a lot of the, you know, ADHD, the depression, a lot of these mood-related disorders. They come from lack of neurotransmitters or or increase in toxins or decrease in a lot of the nutrients to help run our metabolic systems. We know all of our neurochemistry comes from amino acids and proteins and healthy cholesterols to make our hormones. So when you see patients, they, they've switched to this really healthy diet. You've got their macros dialed in. Let's say they need a boost. What kind of supplements are you doing to help kind of replete their brain chemicals or support them back to a baseline? So I don't do much with supplementation at mm -hmm. all. What I do is I help people do the transition right? So getting them on all of the basics, yep. like we said, with real food, functional movement and healthy lifestyle habits, getting that foundation yeah. solid, right? Uh, and then I'm helping them with the psychology side of things. If they have trouble, like we talked about in the beginning, if they're having underlying issues, um, and we find through this process of building a solid foundation that they're having underlying issues, guess what? I'm sending them to Dr. Justin. Right. I'm like, go investigate this. This is this is great that you found out that this is happening right now. Go to somebody to help investigate this and they will develop a plan for you to solve these underlying issues. Right. Because not everybody has these underlying issues. Right. Very many people can just build that solid foundation and get magnificent results. The few people that do have those underlying issues, I'm like, hey, here's Dr. Justin. Go talk to him. Here's this guy. Go talk to him, you know, et cetera. So I'm referring them out, getting them to uh, somebody who specializes in that. Great. And what's the biggest mindset issue that you're seeing? What's popping up the most frequently? So the biggest, the biggest one, again, going back to just basic manipulation that people really don't even know is occurring. And, um, there's, there's a lot of ways that this happens, but it's a, it's a sign that if you keep setting goals for yourself and you keep making very, very short term progress followed by failure, and you just repeat this cycle over and over and over again, that is a symptom to me that this is a majorly probably has to do with psychology and mindset, Yeah. right? The fact that you have these intentions and you just can't get your behavior to align yeah. with your good intentions. So um, that is this realization that, oh, it's because my behavior is being manipulated. And then we get into investigating what is actually manipulating my behavior. 
That's great. I always tell patients that there's power in why. You need a big why to overcome whatever issue you're dealing with. So whether it's fatigue, well, why the heck do you want to get your energy back? And then you dig in deep. Oh, well, they want to spend time with their kids on the weekend and go for a hike or, or do this thing that's active with their with their partner. So that's the real why. And then that's the really important thing to, to hinge on and push that emotional button because that's what drives motivation. How much are you finding the, the why with your, your with your patients? That it's absolutely huge. I mean, I tell people all the time that if your why is to have a, a bikini body for this summer, two months from now, and that's your, like your biggest motivation. Well, guess what? This, this process from A to B is not a straight line. This process from A to B is a squiggly that goes all over the place. And you may go backwards for a little while before you go forwards again. Like you said, there may be some underlying issues that have to be investigated, some special supplementation, some yeah. special protocols to follow. You're running into obstacles. You're not going to be able to do all of that work if yeah. the biggest why you had was to get a bikini body two yes. months from now, right? You've got to play the long game. You have to be invested in your actual health. You have to be knowing that these obstacles are going to be coming along and being willing to overcome them. So I use the example, you know, when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, for example, and their doctor's like, you know, I, I really think that you, you're, you you got to change your diet if you want to, you know, have any chance of recovering from this. They go home and they change their freaking diet and yeah. they do it like they, they're not falling off the wagon, right? They're not losing motivation because they have a, a ginormous why, <laughs> right? Like they have this massive obstacle in front of them and they are determined to overcome it. So that's the power of a big why. I think a lot of people go into this with these tiny little whys and then they come across the first obstacle and they're like, ah, well, well it's not worth it, you know, and they just, they abandon ship. So yeah, having a big why is a is a good first start. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna dig a little deeper here. So back in 2009, I think you mentioned in your story you were 60 pounds overweight. Mm -hmm. So what was your why? How did you get your brain wrapped around this so you can get motivated and have a sustainable weight loss? The first thing was that I I felt like a fraud to my students that I was teaching. I was a martial arts instructor at the Got time, it. and I'm sitting here telling them, "Hey, you need to take care of your body. You need to eat well. You need to make sure that you're coming to class all the time. Things like that, right?" And here I was, 60 pounds overweight, and the doctor's telling me that I'm not I'm not healthy. Now I was. It's it's not like I wasn't trying, I, but I was just yeah. following conventional advice, and the conventional advice. I say I dieted up to 220 pounds because right? yeah. every time I lost 10, I would gain 15 or 20. Right. Um, so at that point, I was like, look, I've, I've, I'm failing my students, which was very meaningful to me. I've got 125 students looking up to me at that point, and I, I've got to make these changes, not just for myself, but for them as well, for this leadership position that I'm in. So that was one of the big whys. The second was that you know I was already talking with my wife about potentially having kids, and I was looking looking at the future saying, do I want to be around for those kids? You know, yeah. we're going to have them. Right. So that was another big why for me. Um, but you know, those whys also, even though they were big, um, they didn't stop me from failing again. Even after I transitioned to real food and functional movement, I got down to about 180 pounds, 175 pounds. And then I quote unquote fell off the wagon or relapsed. And I went back up to like 195 before I figured out this is a this is a mindset psychology issue. Like I now I have all the right information and for some reason I still can't put it into practice consistently and that's when I really started investigating into uh, like the manipulation of behavior. I love that. So just to reiterate though, your big whys or your big your big goals and whys were you want to be authentic to the students you were teaching and you yep. wanted to be around for your kids. You wanted to be healthy so you could have quality of life and be able to spend that time active with your kids. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I was looking at my own childhood and my, so my parents had me later in life. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, I'd be asking my dad to do stuff and he was older, right? So he didn't have the energy all of the time or just physically couldn't do what I wanted to do. And when I looked at having my own kids, I was like, you know what, when they ask me to do something that's like physical and outdoors and play and stuff, like, I want to be, I want to, number one, I want to have the energy to do it. Number two, I want to have the physical capacity to do it. Uh, and I realized that, look, if I stay 60 pounds overweight and I have high blood pressure and I have all these other health issues, like that's there's a big potential that that's not going to happen that way. So that was um, looking forwards at that was a was a big reason. I love that. And you also talk about like you have your goal. Let's say your timeline is like six months. You have some metrics along the way. So, you know, if 
one month in, are you on track? It's like mm -hmm. if you got your phone, if you got a compass, and you know you're trying to get here to a thousand miles away, you want to know that you're you're on the right track. One hour, two hours, three hours into your journey. I know you talk about here using the Bod Pod and taking different measurements and making sure you have metrics that help give you confidence you're moving in the right direction. What kind of metrics are you doing with your with your clients outside of what you already talked about using the Bod Pod for body fat or just simple measuring tape to ensure you're on the right track? Yeah. So the first thing I tell them is to ditch the scale because yeah. it causes massive amounts oh, of problems. It's, yeah, it is a it is a horrible measuring stick. So that alone helps a lot because they're not going crazy about weight uh, fluctuations day to day. Right. So yeah. that's probably the number one reason that someone would get derailed is they're using weight as a measuring stick. They're measuring every single day or, uh, you know, even every few days is still a problem. Um, so I start to get them focused on actual health metrics, you know, either, first of all, when they, they start the program, I have them go to wellness FX and they get a, a panel done. And then yep. I ask them to do that again at the end of the program after four months. Um, so that's kind of a long-term play. Like they're going to see what happened to their numbers at the end of the, the end of the program. Uh, but along the way they are taking measurements. Pictures is a big one because Huge. people will look at themselves in a mirror and believe that they don't see any changes. Uh, but because they see themselves every single day, they just don't notice. Right. Um, so by taking pictures, they can actually look and that's a much better visual visual representation of what's happening. I also have them make sure that they're paying attention to their energy levels, their sleep quality, their sleep quantity, um, their any ailments that they came with, like joint pain, inflammation, bloating. Like if those things are going away um, and your energy levels are up, like these are markers that are very important that people rarely pay attention to. And in fact, if they Huge. only have a weight goal, they only have a weight goal, they will abandon the process, even though all those other things are being improved, which are magnificent. <laughs> If the scale doesn't say yes. some arbitrary number they set. So it's terrible. Like, the, so, you know, getting them to focus on what actually matters, I think is very critical. Yeah. I, uh, Dr. Diana Schwarzwein said it perfectly. You get healthy. You don't lose weight to get healthy. You get healthy and then you lose weight. Right. And I love that because I see so many patients, they come in, they have like their top 10 list, right? Their number one thing is the weight loss, Yeah. but their joint pain goes down, their their energy goes up, their focus, their brain fog, their mood, their libido, everything improves, their sleep improves, yet they don't even see it because they have blinders on for that number one goal, which is the weight loss, but everything else just becomes swept under the carpet. Absolutely. And the, and our job as coaches and, and trainers and is to show them, look, this is absolutely going to derail you. Like we work with people all the time. This is the number one that you have to let this go, right? You have to focus on these other metrics that actually matter. Like that's our job because if we don't, if we don't communicate that we're going to have another failed client and that's on us. 100%. Now, being a new dad, you've already mentioned, you alluded in the preface of the show that sleep's obviously an issue for a newborn, and this is round two for you. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about sleep for a second and just how important it is for stress hormones? And then can you go into some of the strategies that you've come up with from a hands-on perspective going through it personally? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, when people talk about energy levels and brain fog and thing like things like that, the, what I try to communicate to people is, and I use the analogy of the sun, like what what has the most impact day to day on the temperature of the air the temperature of the environment and it's the sun like when the sun mm -hmm. comes up it changes the temperature radically and when the sun goes down it changes the temperature radically okay it's a major influence sleep is like that for your energy levels and your brain fog and your immune function like it it controls so much it has such a magnificent influence and if you are not sleeping well or you're not sleeping enough you can expect that you won't be losing any weight you can expect that you will have brain fog you can expect that you will be tired throughout the day and and if you do this over time, of course, you are screwing up, first of all, like hunger satiety signals like we talked about, right? Yeah. So leptin signaling is going to be down. Ghrelin signaling is going to be up. You're going to be hungrier. You're going to be less able to feel full. And you're going to be reaching, studies show, for those 
uh, fast acting carbohydrates, right? Sugar and yeah. comfort foods. So it really deranges so much. And I notice this in myself, you know, when I go three days of getting up at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. because, you know, my daughter, here she is teething and she can't sleep and uh, I don't want to wake my wife up. So I take her downstairs and we're just kind of sitting in the dark, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and I know I'm not getting enough sleep. I realize the next day that I'm reaching, I'm, my brain is like, you need to go get some potato chips, man. That sounds really good. You need to go get some ice cream. Yeah. Like th that stuff doesn't happen when I'm getting great sleep, you know? Um, so the stress that's caused by the lack of sleep deranges so many other things. Uh, it, it's, it's a major impact. Yeah, a few weeks without sleep. I think they did a study on college students. I think after two weeks of getting five hours of sleep or less per night, the group of the cohort was insulin resistant or uh, basically pre-diabetic within two weeks. So we know sleep is so important. And we know, like you mentioned in your um, – lose body fat blog, how insulin and leptin so important. And when you're insulin resistant, you're leptin resistant. And when you're leptin resistant, your cravings really take hold. Yeah. And when your cravings, like you just said, so you're insulin resistant, your cravings take hold, you go eat the ice cream or you go eat the potato chips. And now you're in this position where your body can't even handle that. Right. So yeah. it's a double whammy. Makes sense. Now you said something really telling you do a wellness FX blood testing screen on a lot of your patients coming in, which is great. So you get some good baseline data, what percent of your clientele are coming in with a thyroid issue, an undiagnosed thyroid issue that you're able to pick up on lab testing? Uh, so what they do actually through wellness FX, which is great because I don't have to handle it at all. Uh, mm -hmm. they go to wellness FX and they do a consult with the doctor, uh, that works with wellness FX on their results. So then there, if there's any abnormalities, they're just passing along that information to me. So I don't even have to look at, at their, at their labs. They get to do that through wellness FX with their consult. Um, I would say that, you know, 20 to 30%. Um, are coming in with some sort of underlying issue, not necessarily thyroid, but I would say 20 to 30% are coming in with some underlying issue that they're finding through wellness FX. Um, so that's very important because we're starting off on the right foot. Whereas I tell people like, if you don't go get this done, we're kind of throwing darts at a dartboard, right? Um, and then you go get it at the end. You don't really know what's changed because you didn't have a, you didn't have markers to look at up front. So, um, I think it's really important. And, you know, going back to see the changes is really important as well. I've told people from the beginning that the goal is to objectively improve your health. And so if you're not getting these markers done, there's no way to verify that, you know, of course your pants might be fitting better and your energy levels are up and all of this. But if you really want to see the changes, objective evidence, then this is the, the route you need to go. Got it. Yeah. I love your article on 11 reasons why you're struggling to lose body fat. And I think that ties into a lot of the stuff you were talking about regarding cravings, but you really hit all the major areas. We talked about the real food stuff. We talked about the cravings. You talked about the sleep and the thyroid and the leptin resistance. You also mentioned one other thing in here that's really good. A very holistic article hit all the, the areas. So good job on that. Thank you. But you mentioned the gut stuff. Can you talk more about the gut and the microbiome and how important that is for optimal fat loss and cravings too? Yeah. So, I mean, if we talk about gut dysfunction, um, just right off the bat, like if you, if, if your gut is, is not working in good order, you're eating really healthy foods, you just switch to a real food diet, right? You're trying to maximize that nutrition. It's quite possible that you're not extracting the nutrition from those foods, right? So you are still yes. malnourished. Uh, in a way. And then, of course, the gut is tied to the brain. So if you are having gut disorders, it's very common to also have mood issues and energy issues and the brain fog going on. Uh, they call the, the gut the second brain, right? So it's like it, this is a major aspect of your health. And, and if we ignore it, which I don't know about you, but anytime I did any sort of program in the, in the mainstream health and fitness yeah. industry, I didn't hear a single word about gut health. Right. Right. Um, you, you have like, it's, it's mind boggling to me that they just continue to harp on this. It's all about calories in calories yeah. out. And you know, our latest and greatest exercise DVD. It's just, it's, it's really mind blowing to me. Um, but yeah, gut is uh, majorly, majorly important. And you know, I think the research is still in its infancy, yeah. right? Um, I'm not even confident. I wanted to ask you about your take right now on probiotics, because I'm not even confident that if, if we haven't analyzed like the composition of our gut flora, then are we just 
again, going back to the concept of throwing darts at a dartboard, doing that with just random probiotic supplementation and are the probiotics even reaching where they need to reach, right? Um, so I don't know what your take is on probiotics, but I've kind of pulled back a little bit on it and just, I'm saying, look, let's, let's wait for a little bit more research and figure out like what the strategy is actually going to be. What's your take on that? So regarding probiotics, I think they can be very beneficial for people, but the big issue is a lot of people are so sick and their guts are so messed up, it, it's kind of like throwing chum into a, a shark-infested water. We, they yeah. get a lot of probiotic intolerance, a lot of histamine, a lot of bloating, a lot of gas. My analogy is it's like throwing a whole bunch of seeds into a garden full of weeds, mm. or it's like going to the car wash and getting your car waxed before you get it washed. So the people's guts are so messed up. The first thing we really got to do before we even deal with probiotics is get the diet dialed. And once we get the the diet dial and get the kind of the get an even playing field, right? You don't go in your garden and throw down seeds first. You get the weeding done first, and then the seeds help you know better. But there are a couple of strains. I'm a big fan of Mega Spore Biotic is one that I've used with a lot of my chronically sick patients. Mm -hmm. um, it's using a lot of Bacillus coagulin, Subtilis, and Clossii. These strains are very helpful. And um, you know your typical VSL three, which is like your most studied, you know Lactobacillus, Acidophilus type of strain, can be helpful. But a lot of people that don't react to it well, got to get the diet, got to get the dysbiotic SIBO and infections kind of neutralized first. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And now, is there anything – I didn't get a specific – like I was hoping to get like a little biohack or a little tip regarding sleep and, and some of your experience the last year or two. Is there any tip or biohack that you've come up with with sleep because your, your kid's taking that away from you? Uh, the, the thing that I would say most of all is to stop doing the things that really take away from sleep. Uh, so that would be device usage late at night, yes. um, you know, watching television right before yes. you're trying to go to bed or using your phone in the bed or whatever, uh, using, uh, doing anything in your bedroom that's not really related to sleep or like sex. So yeah. if you are, um, doing activities, like I had somebody that, uh, the other day they were telling me how they, they just lay in bed and kind of, um, you know, spend time with their kids just lounging around in bed and, the, but they, they're doing this for an hour and a half, you know, oh. and it's like, you're kind of training your body that other things get to happen when we're in bed. Like yes. we don't necessarily have to sleep in this environment, but you kind of want it to be like a, a, a cozy cave that is reserved for that activity of sleep so that when you get in that bed at night, your brain is already switching into, okay, I know what we do here. Th what we do here is we sleep. All right. I love it. Um, so that's another one. And then I would say getting your blood sugar uh, normalized is very important. Like if you are, if you're having a blood sugar crash in the middle of the night, obviously that's not going to be very helpful to your sleep quality. Um, so paying attention again to diet, uh, throughout the day, stress levels throughout the day, and then getting exercise because you have to use your body for it to really have that need for deeper sleep. I found that when I don't walk, when I don't exercise, I don't sleep well. When I use my body throughout, especially if I've just been sitting, staring at a computer, uh, sitting at a desk all day, terrible sleep that night. If I use my body, if I consistently go out for walks and do my sandbag workouts and do a sprint here and there, I sleep like a baby. So even though I'm not getting, and this is very important for anybody who has kids like me, if you know you're not going to be able to get the quantity of sleep that you need, you must get the quality of sleep that you need. So you have to maximize those hours in the bed. So, um, you know, we, we released a long time ago and I, I don't even sell it anymore. It's just included in our total body reboot program, but it's a guide called rim rehab that I wrote with Evan brand. Yep. Uh, and I think, think he's on your show all the yep. time, right? Evan's so, here. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a ton of, you know, hacks and uh, supplements and all that stuff that it just really is a great overview on how to get great sleep. So uh, definitely check that out. Love that. Yeah. Evan will appreciate that plug. And you heard it, you heard it here first, folks. SS, sleep and sex in the bed. That's it. That's it. Awesome. Is there anything else you want to say about this new craving program that you have coming out soon? How can people get access to it? Is there any other gem or tidbit you want to kind of drop on us here? Yeah, there's a waiting list for it right now. It's uh, so you're not available to get in. We'll probably be doing a official release later in June. Uh, but if you struggle with consistency, if you want to be able to succeed for the rest of your life without using willpower or discipline, if you want to know why your behavior is constantly manipulated and you want to fix it uh, and you want to fix it authentically and, and deeply, then I would encourage you to come check out the program. So you can go to mycravingscode.com and uh, get on the waiting list.
mycravingscode.com. All right, cool. I'm plugging it in right now. That's great. Cool. Awesome. Well, last question here I asked everyone before you, if you have any other plugs, you, you want to drop them, social media stuff, your podcast, anything else? Just go to rebootedbody.com and you can find pretty much everything. There's some free guides there for you, tons of articles, podcasts, et cetera, everything you would expect. So rebootedbody.com is the place. Got it. And I'm on Kevin's blog here right now. It's the real deal. Lots of great content. I love the article on the fat, like I mentioned, and the carbohydrates. Really good practical information. I can tell that you're writing this from a perspective of this is stuff that you actually use with your clients. Is that true? Definitely. Love it. Cool. All right, Kevin. So you're stuck on a desert island. You can only bring one supplement or herb. What is it? Oh man. Um, let's think. I, I would I would say magnesium is is what I'm bringing. What? Um, yeah, I, I just have found uh, so much benefit from from using it, especially just on my nerves. Like yeah. just hey, let's get you know a little nice calm feeling going on. Um, it really helps. So, and I think a lot of people are are deficient in it. Um, so that's my pick. Now, what kind of magnesium? That's the question. <laughs> um, so for a while I was taking, uh, actually kind of still do. I, I just tend to this one natural calm magnesium uh, citrate then. Yeah. So just, you know, it's got a, I think it's made with stevia. So it's a little yep. sweet kick mm -hmm. here. Um, it's kind of enjoyable to, to just sip on. Um, and it works really well for me. Probably easy for the kids to take too, right? Yeah, my daughter takes it. She likes it. Of course, the five-month-old isn't isn't there yet, but <laughs> should yes. be soon, right? Yeah, awesome. Well, Kevin, you're a great guest. I appreciate all your awesome content. I can imagine it's helping millions of people get their health back. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Got a question for Dr. J? Go to beyondwellnessradio.com and click the questions button. Then tune in to hear the answer. Also, if you like the show, click below to review us on iTunes. For more Beyond Wellness Radio, go to beyondwellnessradio.com.